because they realize how powerful women are. When we are educated, we can do so much. We can believe in ourselves. We can help other women. We can drive a change. Who defines what's right and what's wrong? What if what we were told is right is actually wrong? And what we were taught is wrong is actually right. Because when we are accepting ourselves and trying, we're inspiring other people to accept themselves and try. Welcome to yourbrilliance.com. I'm your host, Amy Waterman. And today our topic is leadership. Specifically, what it takes to break free from limitations and step into your own power, your own vision, and your own voice. To talk to us about leadership, we've invited Dima Gowie onto the show. Dima is a motivational speaker and leadership coach who spent two decades in corporate America before leaving to start her own consulting company. Dima knows what it's like to be limited simply for being a, being a woman. She was born in the Middle East, where she struggled to complete her dream of a business diploma because of family pressure. Her father didn't like her attending a co-ed school, and so soon after, she was introduced to an eligible young man and encouraged to marry. And she did. She married and went to San Diego at the tender age of 20. But she soon found she had brought the chains of her culture with her. Five years later, she found she couldn't take it anymore. She couldn't continue living like that. She had to break free to discover who she could be and to find out if those childhood dreams were simply the fantasies of a young girl or a very real possibility. Today, Dima is here to talk to us about that journey. The journey from being who others expect you to be to being the light you were born to be. Welcome, Dima. Hi, Amy. So you've been working now to help women get into leadership positions, but you didn't have that support when you were starting out. So how did you overcome all of those voices telling you that this was your role and you were supposed to be a good wife and you weren't supposed to look outside uh, what others told you you were supposed to be? Yeah, it wasn't easy. It is, it is absolutely a journey. I grew up to believe that I am a follower. I have to follow what my uh, parents expected of me, the culture. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I got engaged and married at a young age. I was just 19 when I got engaged through a family introduction to a cousin, a distant cousin. And um, since I was a little girl, I used to play a lot with my grandmother. And she taught me early on about the expectations of the culture. She, uh, I was just five years old and she uh, brought a vase and flowers and she was acting as if we're playing a game and we're putting flowers in the vase, but she was very serious and she picked the vase and she told me, do you see this perfect glass vase? A girl is just like it. If it gets cracked for any reason, you can never fix it or glue it back. It will always be seen as cracked. So I was just five. Can you imagine telling a five-year-old girl this, this story? And I didn't understand what it meant, but over the years, I got to understand more and more of the perfect image that the girl has to maintain, how she has to be silenced, how she's not supposed to express her opinion, to complain, or to even aspire for a different life than what is expected of her. So in the Middle East, at least in my family and community, we believe that your fortune, your destiny is written in your forehead. So when you're born, your story is already created. So you don't challenge that, you just live with it. So part of my story is to shatter the glass vase. At, at least that's not what God created with the story. The, the story is I came with a glass vase and I have to protect it. And I challenged the norm and I had to shatter the glass vase. So um, it, it definitely wasn't easy, but it was so much worth it. And I challenged it and I shattered the vase by getting out of an abusive relationship, of um, really believing that I should invest in myself and I should grow and learn. Education is so important. And what I realized that in many suppressive cultures, 
And even, even in many communities here in the U.S., they, they do their best not to educate women because they realize how powerful women are. When we are educated, we can do so much. We can believe in ourselves. We can help other women. We can drive a change. And some cultures don't want that. They want the women to stay suppressed. They want to keep them controlled and to be mainly serving the overall community, the husband, the parents, and that is her role. So in my world, I have so much respect for my community. I love my family, but I am not going to follow the, the destiny that's written on my forehead. I shattered that and I created my own and it's just so beautiful. I love that because I'm thinking about Malala right now and the struggle she's been through to get educated and how empowering her message is to all of us. But over here in America, we often think that's an issue for women in other cultures. Our culture is very free, we're independent, uh, and we can do anything we want. But when I hear you talk about a glass vase, I was thinking about what does a glass vase look like for the typical American woman? And I can see it in my head, and it's the woman I see in the pages of women's magazines. Now, I love women's magazines, but they tell me I am supposed to be beautiful, and I am supposed to have a handsome, rich guy on my <laughs> arm, and I am supposed to have such a good career, and I look so cute in those suits. I look amazing in those suits in my imagination. And there's this perfect woman and we all aspire to be her, and she has to have everything, the career and the man and the looks. And if she has, doesn't have any one of those, she's not perfect. So when I hear you talking about shattering the glass vase, I think there's also a sense of loss about that. There's a sense of loss about this perfect woman we think we can be and we can't. Once that glass vase is shattered, who can we be? How can we? think of a destiny for ourselves that isn't what we've been told. Right. It's become, it, be, it makes us become the owners of a new story. And uh, one time I was on a panel and a question came to one of the other panelists. And her answer was, who defines what's right and what's wrong? What if what we were told is right is actually wrong? And what we were taught is wrong is actually right. And it's just it stick with me until today. It's been years. And that's the same as what you're talking about, the perfection. We're taught to be perfect. The perfect, uh, as you mentioned, the, the wife, the daughter, the mother, the employee. And that's why so many women struggle with work-life balance. Every single event I'm in, that, that's a question that comes up. And they're really working so hard to achieve that. But what happens is they end up losing themselves because they're trying to please everybody around them. There's no more time for them to, to just sit and stare at the wall, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> or to, to work out or to take courses or to, to find a coach to work on their development. They end up wanting to be perfect. They want the perfect Christmas, the perfect marriage, the perfect everything. And that's why it makes so many people disappointed and depressed because we're aspiring for perfection. And since perfection is not there, they think that there's something wrong with them. And as a result, they become depressed. They, that affects their self-worth and um, they just keep putting themselves down. So the image of perfection gets worse and worse and worse for them because it's not just it's not attainable, they think that there's something wrong with them, that they're not achieving it. And I want to add a comment about uh, Malala. I love Malala, but who I love a lot is her dad. Her dad gave a TED Talk, and he said at the end of his TED Talk that people ask him all the time, what did you do to have her be this so amazing and so empowering? And he answered, it's not what I did or what I do. It is what I didn't do. I did not clip her wings. Oh. I'm getting goosebumps just saying it, and I say it all the time. I did not clip her wings. So think of us as women. Since we're so young, our wings are clipped. 
and whether and regardless of the culture i work with women around the world and i used to think it's just me that there's something wrong with me because of my story and my upbringing and all the the control i had to live through it's not it's not just me it's all women around the world so we're clipped with the expectations of the culture we're clipped with a lot of things you're talking about with the people magazine and the image of the perfect woman that we all aspire to be and we're clipped by the expectation of the perfect marriage we're clipped by hearing messages that companies want more women in leadership but somehow it's not happening fast enough or it's not happening rationally so there's conflicting messages that we constantly live with and that's continuing to clip our wings so that's why i love the guy he is just so amazing just this one phrase um, i i look up so much to him so think of parents and communities if they start thinking like him where they allow their daughters and they allow their sons to be who they are to aspire to expand their potential to accept them for the way they are things will be very different and what cultures don't realize that when they're suppressing women they're actually suppressing men people don't think about that because if the woman is suppressed She's not going to raise great children. If she's depressed and not educated, she's not going to be able to give more and more to her sons and her daughters. If she is suppressed, she's going to try to suppress everybody around her. So by that, everybody loses. And that's why we need to change that. That's why you're doing what I'm do you're doing and I'm doing what I'm doing because it's time to change it. So we were hoping last year that, that things might change. We had a woman running for president for the very first time. And regardless of whether she was a good candidate or should have won, what mattered was that something had been broken in the system. Finally, a woman could be considered in the running. And one of the pivotal moments was when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were in a debate and she had said something and he said, such a nasty woman because women who dare to run for power are nasty women. They're not real women. There's something wrong with them. So then the hashtag started trending, I am a nasty woman because, and women took back that phrase. And it was a real shock for a lot of us because we didn't expect there to be such backlash because of she was a woman. There was something wrong with a woman running for power. And this year we had Wonder Woman, hit the box office, stun everybody, and show that actually here's a woman who's powerful and we love it. So as women, when we approach the idea of, you know, who am I to seek power? We've got these different ideas in our head. On the one hand, we think, you know, Wonder Woman. And on the other hand, we think somebody's going to call me a nasty woman. How do we, how do we reconcile that? Mm, yeah, this is, this is such a, conflicting messages that we keep getting on a daily basis. And um, I agree with you about what, what's going on with Donald Trump and also with Wonder Woman. And with Wonder Woman, I have to share something. There's something about, um, um, I think, perception or prejudices. I didn't watch the movie. I automatically assumed it's going to be so sexual of they're going to sexualize this woman. And I am going to go so mad and upset in the theater and I don't want to even see it. So I am one of the few people who hasn't seen it. And when I saw your, uh, like we, when we were talking about the questions and saw the messages that you sent me, I actually called one of my friends who saw Wonder Woman because I'm, I was wondering, did you mean it as a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not going to watch Water, uh, Wonder Woman and see another woman being sexualized. So, uh, and she's like, it's amazing. It's wonderful. I'm like, oh, good. I have to watch this movie. But in my head, I automatically assumed that is something bad for a woman. And I automatically assume that I don't want to see it, even though apparently it's a great thing. So uh, the conflicting messages, I think we're going to continue to experience them. We're going to continue to live with them. And it's just a matter of making a choice of which one we're going to select. Um, this is not going to go anytime soon. And we are going to get to a point where there's going to be no issues between uh, the two genders and we're going to get to become equal somewhere in the far, far future. So there is hope because we're, uh, we're getting there. So if you think of our life, it's better than 
our uh, grandmothers and better than the grand great grandmothers and our daughter's lives are better. There's still issues and there's still vases that we are still passing from one generation to another. So it's not done yet, but we are heading into a positive place. As we are heading to that positive place, there's going to be conflict in forces and there's going to be conflict in messages because one force wants to push us backward and the other force wants to move us forward. And, um, and we are in between. We are in between. We're like, we don't know which way to go. And that's why we, we need to realize we have a choice. We have a real a choice to continue to educate ourselves, invest in ourselves, um, put ourselves as a priority, which is so difficult for women, and help other women, which is critical. So by, by focusing on this, in a way, we're pushing the pendulum a little closer to the other side. Um, but it's not going to be easy. So even with my grandmother, I mentioned about her story with the vase. But my grandmother told me another amazing story about graduation because she wanted me to be the first educated woman in our family. She was not allowed to go to school and she taught herself the alphabet. She actually would sit next to her brothers after they come back from school. She, she had five brothers and she would listen to every word they said and try to capture the sounds and the, the shapes of alphabet because she wanted to read a magazine similar to People magazine. Mm -hmm. It's called Al Mawad and it's in the Middle East. But my grandmother did not allow her daughters to, to, um, to go to university. So my mom and my aunt, they finished high school. They did not go to the university. And she wanted somehow me to be different. She wanted me to be educated. So since I was five years old, again, five years old, she created a whole graduation ceremony in her kitchen. So she would take one of her magazines and roll it and tie it with a red ribbon. And she told me, we're going to play a new game. We're going to celebrate the day you graduate from college. So, um, and she would have me stand, she would announce my name to a huge invisible audience, and she would say, help me to congratulate the next graduate, Dima Gawi, points to me to go closer to her, and she hands me the diploma as she's crying and really, really wanting me to graduate. So think of the conflicting messages, similar to what you mentioned with Wonder Woman and the messages we're getting from Trump. Don't break the vase but inspire to be educated, inspire to have your own individuality. I wonder if my grandmother realized that with me getting educated, that I'm going to resist the negative messages and the stories that I was taught. Would she want me to graduate then? It's tricky, right? I don't think in her situation she linked the two. She played two games that are very, very conflicting very conflicting and they cannot survive both at the same time. I cannot be educated and empowered and self-confident and at the same time maintain a perfect vase. And this is what we live with every single day. Think about it. Think about every single woman's life, even men's life, where there's certain expectations that we want them and we expect from them culturally. But at the same time, we're like, be yourself. Don't, don't be afraid. Pursue your dreams. But at the same time, it's just it's so conflicting. It just doesn't work. And um, yeah, so this is really the summary of humanity to me. <laughs> we are in such a tough spot as women. You know, it's exactly what you said. We, we have all these aspirational, empowering messages. But then on the other hand, we have all the shame and the sense of failure. It just feels like we are, we do have a responsibility to other women right now because the fight isn't over. One of the things I really think a lot about is um, it was interesting that you had worried that Wonder Woman would be sexualized. That was actually quite a, <laughs> quite a big concern. And uh, the lead actress almost didn't get the role because her breasts weren't big enough. Oh, oh. terrible. But um, one of the wonderful things about her costume is that you see it getting all dirty and grim and beaten, showing that she's a warrior. She doesn't just keep her clothes clean and dress in designer. She gets dirty and dinged yeah. up and she fights. And one of the things I often worry about when it comes to inspiring women is that women like the idea of aspiring to their dreams, but they are faced with the reality that they are going to be judged on their looks. 
Yeah. If you're not attractive enough, you know, you're not going to get on uh, American Idol, you know, even in your singing career. If you don't have the right body, you're not going to be able to achieve your career, even if your voice is the voice of an angel. So it sometimes feels like it's not even worth trying because we're setting ourselves up for such judgment. Mm. It is so worth trying because when we are accepting ourselves and trying, we're inspiring other people to accept themselves and try. It's, and it's not easy. Again, we're going against the norm and it's easy to say what I'm saying right now, but we have to, we have to continue trying. We have to. So the lady that you mentioned, somebody with the voice of an angel, she needs to stand and sing to a point that people stop seeing any flaws that she sees in herself. And the challenge is in many situations, we're our worst person who judges ourselves. People judge us less than we judge ourselves. So I'll share a story. When I did my first TEDx and everybody was emailing me and calling me and telling me how much they felt inspired and how much they loved it. I had men from India email me and tell me that how much they cried when they watched it because they related to it. And I don't know these people. Like, I don't know how they got my email. I don't know how they, they got the TEDx. But guess what I was thinking about when I watched it on, the, on, the, on YouTube the first time? Oh, my butt is so big. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Oh. So here, I, here we are. Everybody is so uh, motivated and connecting with the message. And all I think about is my butt, that it is so big. Um, and we, we all have tendency to do that. So we just, we just need to continue to move forward. It's, I don't think we're going to change because you mentioned of the images we see on TV and the magazines, and it is so colorful and attractive, and they know how, how to catch our attention, and we aspire to be like that. And we know that we're not, if we're not, like men may not be interested in us because we know the kind of image that they're programmed as well. They're programmed and we're programmed. And who doesn't want to be um, feeling attracted or attracted by a man? So I, I don't know if that yeah. grammar is correct. Um, so we end up do, going above and beyond and again, beating ourselves down. So my butt is big and it's okay. I have a powerful message. <laughs> well, let's go back to Wonder Woman. What we want is our strength and our power and not necessarily the, the big boobs in the pristine costume. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I think was a really powerful message for women was about eight years ago, it made all the headlines at the time, the Dalai Lama was at a conference and he said that um, the world will be saved by the Western woman. And he actually came out pretty pro-feminism, which you wouldn't necessarily think of a, of a holy religious leader doing that and what i thought about is is how that connects with the wonder woman idea the fact that as women we've got to get over we've got to break that glass face we've got to get over the sense of we're not attractive enough to save the world and we've just got to get out and get out our swords and shields and go save it no matter whether our outfit is correct mm. so what do you think the future is for the western woman what is our role what is our role well, I'll tell you, I disagree with that Dalai Lama. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. And uh, I understand what he's talking about, but I disagree with him. He's talking about that the Western woman is so much more empowered and confident and educated compared to the women of the world. And when other women around the world, they see this Western woman, they would look up to her and she becomes their role model and they want, they want to follow her, her path. I think that's what he means. And as a result, we'll be able to drive more and more change. To me, this message separates men from women. And I don't believe there should be a separation. There's so many amazing men out there. There's so many men that empowered me and believed in me and um, took me through my journey and saw my talents that I didn't even realize. Amazing, amazing men that I have so much respect for. So when we say something like this, like what the Dalai Lama mentioned, I think that's putting men down. And it's not, it's not a positive thing for anybody. 
because uh, I'm not better than a man and I'm not better than a woman in the Middle East and I'm not better than a woman in Europe. We, we all come with certain powerful skills. We just need to bring it to the surface. What I think he meant maybe, maybe, or I hope he meant is the feminine energy. There's a difference between women and femininity. Um, there's so many men with feminine energy. That, and the feminine er energy is really the nurturing, the caring, co a lot of compassion, wanting to make a difference in the world, wanting, wanting to make sure that we're reducing pollution. It is like the energy of love. And this is not gender neutral. Fem being a feminine, a man, and a woman. And that's something that we need to think about because really no one is better than the other. Um, when we start thinking about it that way, we're one and we're just supporting each other in order to continue to grow together. Because men realize that in order for them to advance, they need women. And women realize that in order for them to advance, we need men. And then it's so much better for everybody. I love that. So that is part of your role right now is that you are supporting women to to enter into leadership roles and to do a bit more. Do, could you talk to us a little bit about your work in empowering women? Yes. After my TEDx, I got a lot of messages and uh, from, from people around the world, and they kept asking me to coach them and um, to go speak at women's events. Companies would reach out and they wanted me to speak at their women's groups and luncheons. And I loved it. I was terrified. I, people never realize how terrified I am standing on that stage. I would cry before for days, and, but I would do it anyways. And it got to a point where I had to do it on my own personal time. I was working for IBM. I was managing uh, initially a global team, and then I moved to Louisiana, and I was uh, managing talent development for an entire center that they have in Baton Rouge. So my, my job was very demanding, and here I was at night, writing speeches, on my vacation days, traveling to give speeches, giving speeches on the weekend. And for over a year and a half, I had no life. I was just constantly going forward, moving, moving, moving. And it got to a point where I just physically, I couldn't do it anymore. And I realized that the more I was standing on the stage, connecting with the audience, speaking, giving my speeches, I loved it. I would be at a high. And my job was not giving me that high anymore. And I'm like, I want to be on, on, a, on a high every day. Uh, so for my 40th birthday, uh, I decided that that's going to be my last day. That's my gift, my birthday gift to myself. And I resigned from IBM. I worked for them for 11 years and total experience 20 years because I worked for other companies. And I decided to start a company focused on the advancement of women in leadership. And I do that through one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do it through online programs, uh, also speaking uh, uh, at conferences, giving training, and working with companies to help them understand the value of women in business and help them create metrics in order to continue to measure the progress and to understand what, where are these women. And most of the time, they're at the bottom of the chain or a little in the early, uh, you know, early level management, not much in senior. It's just really opening their eyes. So I've been doing this now uh, almost two years. My birthday is next week and I'll be 42 and I love it. It's not easy. It's a lot of work. There is fear every single day. I'm always worried uh, if like about survival and how I'm going to continue to move forward. But something so powerful keeps encouraging me to move forward. It's some, something divine intuition. I don't know what it is. It's something so, uh, and it doesn't stop talking in my head. It just keeps wanting me to do more and more. I love my life right now. So if I think of starting in the Middle East, this five-year-old girl holding the vase, being so confused, getting so married so early, being in a very unhealthy relationship, uh, feeling lost, not knowing what, how to survive, and now I am in a place where I'm empowering other women that are experiencing similar feelings and I'm able to relate to them because I, I know it's the same story, really different, different uh, uh, characters, names, but it is the same story that I see over and over. The challenge with my coaching, even though I want to do leadership coaching, I realized that most of the women that I'm working and helping, messages keep coming up that are similar. 
the fear of failure, the worry of being judged, an aspiration for perfection, which we talked about earlier. And these are the things that keep stopping them from moving forward. They, they feel stuck. They don't know. Uh, like they're afraid, afraid of taking a risk, afraid of negotiating their salary, afraid of asking for a promotion, afraid of all of these things that keep pushing them back, backwards. So I feel that the majority of the work I'm spending, instead of talking about employee engagement and how to work in a global environment, I'm working with them on addressing their fears and helping them uh, it's never conquer the fear. It never happens, but really managing how to deal with them. That's one. The other one that I keep working with them on, and it's the same message over and over, where they feel that they lost their identity and they feel that a lot of guilt that if they invest in themselves, if they take the time to uh, learn new skills, if they're doing anything outside of their family and their job, they have a lot of guilt about that. They feel that, um, yeah, they, they feel that, oh, um, I should be spending this hour taking care of my kids and playing with my kids. And that's so wonderful. Yes, they should play with the kids, but they also need to make time in order for the, to focus on their growth because nobody else will. Their manager will not, the company will not, but the manager, if the, if the manager sees that a woman is focused on her growth and she wants to learn and she's curious and she's, she's really dedicated to herself as much as other people and job, they would want to promote her. I would want to promote her too. And that is part of the challenge that I continue to face and see that that's part of why women don't get promoted. Not because they're not educated, they are. Not because they're not skilled, they are. It's these other, other things that are standing in our way. I uh, just, that makes so much sense to me when one of the biggest decisions I made, something that totally turned my life upside down was made because I looked at my daughter and uh, I thought she's, I'm going to be her model of what a woman is. She's going to look at me and she's going to think this is what mummies are like. And I did not like the woman I was. And I knew that if I stayed in the same pattern, that woman was never going to change. And my daughter would look at me and think, I don't want to be like my mother because uh, she's not happy. She never achieved her dreams. And so that is what gave me the courage to make a really big decision to take a risk and risk failure and give up everything I had because I knew that it wasn't just for me. It was for future generations. And so sometimes that's what women need in order to give themselves permission to develop themselves is to think this isn't selfish. This is so that I can become a magnificent woman that my children are going to look up to and think, yes, that is who I want to be. Yes. Uh, and also for our listeners, if you want to learn more about Dima and her coaching and her work and her TED Talks, you can go to yourbrilliance.org slash Dima, D-I-M-A. Again, that's yourbrilliance.org slash Dima. So we're wrapping up and Dima, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a fantastic conversation. And I just wanted to ask you if there was one last thought you'd like to share with our listeners. Yeah, of course. Before I share the one last thought, I want to mention that I am delighted to offer all the listeners a free audio uh, program. It's a two-hour program talking about uh, shattering limitations in our personal and professional life. So Amy, will, uh, you will include the link okay. and the code is COURAGE in uh, all in caps. So we'll include that one on your website as well. So this is my gift to everybody and I hope you enjoy it and you'll be inspired to shatter your limitations. The one last point uh, as you, your question is that I want to share, it's really a story. One, one time my nephew came to visit me. He lives in California. I am in Louisiana. He was three years old and it was his first time on the plane and he was just like so excited but also very exhausted. When we got to my home, he ran inside my home and he found a bowl that I have that I put in it all the shards from the vases that I shatter. And I shatter a lot of them. So that was, it was just a few months after my first TEDx. And, and to me, it's very liberating looking at this ball that has all the shards. And it's just so cool. Love it. And he looked at it and he said, 
Tima, what is this? And I, you know, when you have a moment where the world stops, and I, sa- I asked myself, like, would I tell him, your auntie is crazy? She collects broken glass? Like, how would you describe that to a three-year-old? Or do I tell him that because of this broken glass, you are here today. Because, this bro- because of this broken glass, your mom is free. Your grandmother is free. And your auntie is free. We shattered the cycle of abuse for us and for you. And that's what the message I want to share with everybody. When you shatter limitations, when you believe in yourself, you invest in yourself, you break these phases, you're not doing it just for you. You're creating a better life for the future generation. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to have consequences? Yes. Is it worth it? Yes. Thank you so much, Dima. I'm Amy Waterman for YourBrilliance.com, and thank you so much for joining us. We hope you come back and listen to us again soon. Thanks so much, and until then, let your brilliance shine.